now by the bulletin and your sermon notes that uh, it seems like this is a Shakespearean style message to be or not to be, but I want you to know it's going to go far deeper than that because when we look at this text, you're going to discover it's more than just a question that's being posed. It's a decision that you and I are going to have to wrestle with this morning. And we read from John chapter 8, verses 1, uh, 31 through 32, these words. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. <coughs> then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What a wonderful expression that is, right? Well, already to this point, we have dealt with two of our core values here at Turnpike Wesleyan Church. Several weeks ago, we dealt with worship and what worship is, what worship means, how worship can be expressed. Worship is giving glory to God for who He is and what He's done, our relationship with Him. Worship doesn't happen just on a Sunday morning. Worship is an attitude of our heart that takes place every day of the week. And then last week, we talked about fellowship. And we recognize that real fellowship can only happen when we have the vertical fellowship between us and God. Once that's properly in place, then we can have a horizontal fellowship with one another in the body of Christ. Well, today we're going to be talking about the third core value, and that is discipleship. And let me say this now in case I forget somewhere along this series. These core values are not in any particular order or in any particular priority. They're all of equal importance woven together that truly identify who we are as the Turnpike Wesleyan Church. And when we get into the area of discipleship, I'm just going to make a confession right now. There are some areas I really struggle with. And I think as we talk through discipleship, you're going to say, ooh, ow, that hurts. Uh, there's some areas I'm struggling with as well. But the reason I struggle probably more than you, I was told, this really happened, that if my IQ is five points higher, I'd be perfect. <laughs> the perfect idiot. <laughs> then, while I was attending Spanish, I had a type of language in high school, and so I chose Spanish. You know, I struggled with English. Why would they do that to somebody? You talk about destroying a person's self-image and confidence, but I took Spanish, and there was no Spanish name for Norman. Guess what it actually interpreted to? Nacho. <laughs> so that was my Spanish name, Nacho. And the Spanish teacher, knowing that I struggled so much in his class, would always ask, hey, Nacho Smart, can you answer this question? I'll put it together, and this is a true story. So in that realm of life, as well as in the spiritual life, I'm a work that's in constant progress. But I think we all would say the same, right? The word discipleship is used in the Bible as a synonym for being a Christian. What it means is a Christ follower or a student of the Lord. So when we refer to Christians as disciples, what we're doing is actually identifying them as followers of Jesus Christ, as students of his life and of his teaching. But there's something more that's even implied in this idea and concept of discipleship. It also carries the idea of imitation. So disciples of Jesus Christ are those who are seeking, not just intellectually, not just to understand Christianity from that perspective, but they're also seeking to be like Jesus. Disciples of Jesus Christ are people who are desiring to model their lives like the Lord himself, who are wanting to walk in his footsteps. So yes, we study the life of Christ. We observe how he encounters and relates to all kinds of people, children, family, soldiers back then, kings, poor people, wealthy people, hurting people, needing people, even how he interacted with religious hypocrites and those who were false disciples or false prophets. We take account of his interaction in all those ways. We also see how God interacted with his own father, 
the times he pulled aside for prayer, the times he communed with God. We note as we study his life, his courage, his compassion, his wisdom, his humility, his patience, his strength. And then having studied Christ, now we try to imitate him, but we can only do that when we have a relationship with him, and the Holy Spirit has his right place in our lives. You and I can read all kinds of self-help books, we can read all kinds of things about the life of Christ, but if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus himself, everything else will be to no avail. So you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you study, you imitate, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you ask him to walk as Jesus did. But there's more, and here's where the church comes in. As we grow as disciples of Jesus Christ by observing his life and following thereafter, we ourselves become examples to others on what it means to be a Christian. Notice what 1 Corinthians 11 1 says, and the Apostle Paul is saying this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Hmm, what does that mean? It means that there should be those in our congregation whose lives are worthy of imitation. Amen? Amen. Kind of quiet right now. It really means that as a people, we want to become more spiritually mature. We work at becoming more spiritually mature so that our lives then can be a reflection of Jesus Christ and it can be reliable if people are looking at us. How many have ever heard the expression, you may be the only Bible some people read? When you walk outside this building, there are non-Christians that are watching you very carefully. And I realize that we're imperfect people. I do. I realize that we make mistakes and we have hang-ups. There are things that set us back. But overall, if we know Jesus Christ and we love him and we're doing our best through the power of the Holy Spirit to imitate him, the world should see something different in us. There should be something in our lives that speak out. It's almost like a magnet. What is in their life that is so refreshing and so solid? Where does their confidence come from? You see, Paul says, I need to follow Jesus in such a way that I can be an example to others. You and I need to follow Jesus in such a way that our lives also become an example to others. The normal thing for Christians is not that we remain at the lowest level of knowledge and experience. Not that we learn just enough to get by, you know, get through the door, and then put our Bible on the shelf. The normal expected thing in God's eyes is that we become a people who are maturing spiritually so that we can teach and counsel whose attitudes, our attitudes, and our conduct serve as an example to other believers. Notice what it says in Colossians 3.16, I believe this is also in your sermon notes. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Did you catch that? <laughs> May God's word be so powerful in your heart and life that you're able to teach and admonish one another with wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So our goal as followers of Christ, and remember, this is a core value of Turnpike Wesleyan, is that you and I work diligently to mature in our faith, to gain right understanding, to develop spiritual wisdom, and to experience over time what it means to walk with God. And it's not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of those that are around us. God expects us to study his word. He expects us to pray. He expects us to do exactly what we sang about this morning, to trust and obey. Not just so we can be better Christians, although that's a part of it and that will happen. It's not just for our own spiritual benefit, but that we also can teach others how to follow him as well. So what are the marks of discipleship? 
From John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32, we discovered that discipleship, first of all, begins with this word, faith. 128 times is the word believe recorded in the Gospels. 93 times in the Gospel of John. You know, Jesus and his disciples had been together for some time. They had traveled through Galilee together. And the disciples had watched Jesus as he healed the diseased, the disabled, and so many troubled people. They watched Jesus as he told parables, fed thousands of people with just scraps of food. He walked on water, stood up to the criticism of religious leaders. And after all of this, the day finally came when Jesus popped the question. He turned to his disciples and he said, who do you say that I am? Actually, it's who do people say that I am? In other words, Jesus was saying, what's the word on the street? What's the talk out there about who I am? And you know, surprisingly, not much has changed from then to now. So many people out there are making their own decisions and opinions and definitions of who Jesus is. They're rewriting the script, so to speak. And back in Jesus' day, the disciples came forth. Well, people say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're just one of the prophets. And then Jesus looked at the twelve and said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke for the entire group. He said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this morning, that question is posed to your heart and to mine. Because we have to wrestle with that question. Who is the real Jesus? In Luke 14, Jesus shares three examples of those who failed the discipleship test. And it was because of a host of problems. One failed because of a trust issue. Another failed because of a timing issue. The third failed because of a temptation issue. But the bottom line is they all three failed because they did not believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And therefore, they were unwilling to be sold out to him. Well, let me just go down a rabbit trail for a few moments. Have you not enjoyed the month of September thus far? God has given us a wonderful month. But I'm reminded that tomorrow is fall. And what comes after fall? You guys are saying, Pastor, why? Why do you always have to do this? Well, we know we live in the North Country, right? And we know that once fall takes place and winter sets in, uh, this country's landscape can change in the blink of an eye. Well, the reason I set this up is because there was one occasion a number of years ago when I took my kids. I only had three at the time. I took them to St. Lawrence University so that they could go swimming. I had membership there. And I take the kids quite often to their olympic size heated swimming pool. And that they enjoyed it. It was a good father and kid time together. Well, we went one November evening. And it was really a gorgeous evening. And uh, we went, spent about two hours there at the pool swimming. But unknown to us, while we were there at the university, a snow squall developed outside. So by the time I got to the car, and from where I was pastoring there, it was only less than a half hour drive. Well, it would take a lot longer than a half hour to get home. The roads were covered with snow. The landscape had changed. The visibility was down to just a few feet, to maybe a few yards in front of me. So I got the kids in the car, and we started to head home. And I noticed that my oldest daughter, Clarice, was uncomfortable. She was staring out the window, and there was just this frightened look on her face. And finally, she actually turned to me, and she said, Daddy, do you know the way home? Because she could not find any familiar landmark. They were all gone. And I reached over. She was in the front seat. I reached over. I grabbed her hand. And I said, it's OK, Clarice. Dad knows the way home. No sooner did I put my hand back on the steering wheel to focus on the road, I looked over, she was sound asleep. I looked in the rearview mirror, and the other two kids were sound asleep. 
You know why she was sound asleep? Because she believed her dad. She trusted her dad. She said, my dad tells me he can get me home safely. He's going to get me home safely. I have nothing to fear. And soon she relaxed. Well, I've shared this story before with you because as I continue to travel on my way home, I noticed that I too was having fears and doubts in my own heart. There was a sense that ministry was changing constantly. The territory, the places, the landscape was all new to me. There were things that I couldn't do like I used to do. You know, the old was out, the new was in. And I was just feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and tired. And then I whispered a prayer. God, do you know the way? Because I'm lost. I'm trying to figure it all out. And in my heart, God responded, my God. <coughs> Trust in me. I know the way. And even though I didn't go to sleep at the steering wheel, <laughs> that would have been awful for everybody involved, there was a peace that overcame my heart. A peace that all of a sudden, why would I trust God? Why would I put confidence in him? Why am I not more sold out? I believe who he is. I believe his word. I believe his claims. You know, folks, if we don't believe in who Jesus is, then we're going to continually be <coughs> frustrated. In fact, we cannot follow the message if we do not believe the messenger. I think this is the very reason so many churches have surrendered to the culture around them. Because they don't have a solid foundation on Jesus Christ. I think it's the reason so many churches are now open to redefining what the Bible has to teach. And if you're not aware of this, there are many preachers in a host of circles that are telling you the Bible no longer is a book to follow. It's archaic. It's outdated. It's outmoded. But I want you to know the Bible is the living word. It's the breath of God. It will never, ever be outdated. It speaks to our lives today as it did when it was written. But the reason is they lack a relationship with Christ. And churches today desire the applause of the masses rather than the smile and approval of God himself. So it begins with faith, believing in who Jesus is. Then it goes on. Discipleship also involves abiding in the word. The Lord says, if you hold to my teachings here in John chapter 8, you know, a better translation is if you live in my word. Think about that for a minute. Abiding, if you live in my word. That means that we learn for application. We're learning not just for head knowledge, we're learning to live it out. You know, some will boast to me how many times they've read the Bible through. And I'll just say, that's great, I'm glad. I admire you for reading the Bible through, but that's not the point. The point is not how many times you've read the Bible through. The point is how many times has the Bible been through you? How many times has it affected and changed your life? And then finally Jesus says, then you will know the truth. You will know. That word for know is uh, a unique word. Let me just put it that way. Because there's two Greek words for know. One refers to a mental knowledge. In other words, just gathering information. You guys know a lot of things. I know a lot of things. Is what we know going to get us to heaven? Not unless we have the second know put in place. In fact, when you guys go to a grocery store and you buy a can of peas, you know that unless they really made a mistake, when you open it up, you're going to get a can of peas, right? But it doesn't change it. You just know. It's the label's there. You kind of have confidence in the label. But the second word for know is experiential. It means you can know by experiencing Christ himself what is true. And Jesus says, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And the second word is used 140 times in the Gospel of John alone. We can experience the power of God's word in our life through the Holy Spirit if we believe and abide. 
then we'll go. But I'm going to ask the phrase if they come to the platform right now. The question is posed, not just to you, but to myself as well. Are we disciples of Jesus Christ? Not that we have just the intellectual knowledge of him, or not that we're a church member, or not even do you give, do you serve, do you attend, but the question is, are you a disciple? And I've listed in your notes what discipleship actually means. Let me read them for you. Are you a follower? Are you a learner? Do you read and study the scriptures regularly? Do you think about how you can bring your life into harmony with its teachings? Do you think about how you can imitate Christ's example? Do you evaluate your life on a regular basis? Either at the end of each day, or perhaps at the end of a week, a month, hopefully, at the end of a year. And as you evaluate, do you consider whether you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ? Are you actively seeking to develop Christ-like character? Have you identified some character qualities that you would really like to develop in your life? And perhaps others you'd like to extinguish, get rid of. Uh, they're not helpful. They're not beneficial. Are you living in peace with others in the congregation? Now you know why at the beginning I said I'm struggling with some of these things called discipleship. Do you seek reconciliation when there's a conflict? Do you forgive and ask forgiveness? Are you truly confessing your sins to God and asking for His forgiveness and seeking His grace to forsake those sins? Are you praying? Pretty big list there, isn't there? But these are all marks and descriptions of a disciple of Jesus Christ. They form a picture of what it means to follow Christ. So how do we measure up when we look at all these things? If you're like me, we probably don't measure up very well. But you know what? That's okay. Let's start today, right where we're at, to make it a point to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives so that we now can begin being true followers of Jesus Christ. And I urge you to decide today, by the power of His Spirit, that you are going to be a disciple. That's where to be or not to be comes into play. You can ignore discipleship altogether if you like, but you're not going to go very far in your Christian life. You're not going to have victory that the Bible speaks of over and over again. So maybe we make a decision today, even if we've been poor disciples in the past, that we're going to give this some concentration. This is an identifying mark of Turnpike Wesleyan. We want to be an identifying mark of every believer. We're going to be the follower, the apprentice of Christ. And I pray you'll do this not just for your sake, but for the fact that your life then can be an example for others that are around you and for their family as well. So as we stand together and sing our closing song, it's a song of invitation. And if 